This is going to be 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. So Paul came to Thessalonica after leaving Philippi, and the Thessalonians knew that his preaching wasn't in vain. At the beginning of this chapter, we will see characteristics that will make a man's preaching become in vain. We will also see why a man sh should follow Paul's example. But 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 2 says, But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Paul had suffered and was shamefully entreated at Philippi. He was put in prison with Silas for preaching the gospel. Many people see prisoners as very wicked people, but someone may be in prison for Jesus Christ's sake. Paul being one of those people. And Paul being put in prison eventually led to a man getting saved in Acts 16.38. So Paul was leading men to Jesus Christ everywhere he went. Just because he was put in prison didn't soften his toughness for God when he got back on the outside. And notice verse 2 says he was bold. A man who has God backing him will be bold as a lion. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Philippians 1.14, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They spoke the gospel of God with much contention, but people disagreeing with their gospel didn't soften them up and make them quit. The first thing we see that would have made Paul's preaching in vain would be deceit. In 1 Thessalonians 2.3 says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. There are deceivers, and there has always been deceivers. But Paul's exhortation was not of deceit. He didn't mix a lie in with the truth to deceive others. A good false teacher will mix a whole bunch of truth around a lie they do this so they can prove to you that their lie is true many teachers will speak a whole lot of truth to get you to believe a false assumption the church of christ cult members will quote scriptures on the church to prove that the church of christ is the one true church while they never prove that the church of christ cult is the same as the church and the scriptures so they try to prove the Church of Christ is the real deal, but never proved their Church of Christ was the church that the Holy Bible speaks of. The church in the Bible is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ is made up of every born-again believer. And you can read about that in Colossians 1.18. Not only is it made up of every born-again believer, but even every born-again believer who hasn't ever even been baptized in water or ever set foot in a church of Christ in their life. This is the mark of a false teacher who would rather defend his belief than go by the scriptures. When they take a, a lie and mix in a whole bunch of truth to try to prove that lie, that's a mark of a false teacher. And Paul's exhortation was not of deceit. If your preaching is based off of a lie, then what good is it anyway? It may be good for your denomination, your religious beliefs, your income. But what about God? Many of the people who teach lies are actually deceived themselves and don't know they are lying. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. John, or 2 John 1.7 says, For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. But 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. Paul's preaching was also not of uncleanness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. A man who is preaching in vain will mix things of the world with the gospel, to attract lost people. Even if a person gets saved after hearing a Christian rock group perform, 
do you think he will turn from his idols, as it talks about in 1 Thessalonians 1.9? Do you think he'll turn from his idols after he gets saved? When you led him to the Lord Jesus Christ by mixing his idol, which is rock music, you mix that with the gospel? There are churches that have Harry Potter and Star Wars themed church activities to attract little kids. But why not just attract them with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible? There are things in the Bible way more interesting than any movie has to offer. But people only think it is a bunch of names because they haven't read it all the way through. Paul said, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. This doesn't mean he became or participated in something sinful to win the lost people. Only the people who are love sick for this present evil world, as Paul calls it in Galatians 1.4, will use the method of mixing the world in with the gospel to try and reach people. That's having your ministry full of uncleanness. And Paul's preaching was not of uncleanness. Not only this, but Paul's exhortation was not in guile. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. The Bible refers to Jesus Christ and says, Neither was guile found in his mouth. In 1 Peter 1, 21 through 22, Paul didn't give the gospel out using guile. He didn't give it out in a slick way. He wasn't sly and cunning because he just put the truth out there for people to accept it or reject it. If you, if you have to trick people into the truth, did they really get the truth? Should the, should, you should put the truth out openly and in people's face and leave it up to them to accept it or reject it. Paul was obviously being sarcastic in 2 Corinthians 12, 16 when he said he caught the Corinthians with guile. Because they, as you can see from the verses below, guile is definitely not a good thing. These verses are Psalms 32 and verse 2, which says, Blessed is the man into whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Psalms 34, 13, Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. 1 Peter 2, 1, Wherefore laying aside all malice, and all guile. 1 Peter 3, 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Revelation 14, 5, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Also, Paul was trustworthy with the gospel. As you can see in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. If you are saved, then God has entrusted you with the gospel. The gospel that saves us today was revealed to Paul. Ephesians 3, 1 through 5 shows that the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 was revealed to Paul. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Before Paul, the apostles couldn't make heads or tails of the gospel. And you can see that clearly in verses like, New, like Luke 9.45, 18.34, and right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter was clueless. At what had taken place. And you can read about that in Luke 24, 12. The disciples were so clueless about the death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus Christ had to sit and expound the scriptures to them concerning himself. Luke 24 and 25 says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So if people before the cross were saved by looking forward to the cross, then why didn't the apostles even understand that Jesus Christ had to die, be buried, and resurrected? 
the truth is the gospel was revealed to Paul, Paul revealed it to us, and if you are saved, then you have been entrusted with the gospel. Learning from Paul's example, if you don't want to preach in vain, then don't be a man pleaser. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. The one we need to please is God. We shouldn't worry about pleasing man. As it talks about in Galatians 1.10, it says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Notice 1 Thessalonians 2.4 says that God trieth our hearts. And Psalm 7.9 says, But establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. God knows your heart and knows whether or not you are doing things to please Him. Someone who wants to please God will stick up for a truth no matter who gets their feelings hurt. A man pleaser will only tell you what you want to hear. And that leads to the next point. And that is that Paul didn't use flattering words. 1 Thessalonians 2.5 says, For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. The Bible warns against giving flattering titles to man in Job 31, 21 through 22. And calling your Baalite priest father would be a flattering title. And that is against scripture. Matthew 23, 9 says, call no man on earth your father. Uh, watch out if you are around someone who is always giving you compliments. Proverbs 7, 21 and Psalms 5, 9, 78, 36 are good references on this. And Psalms 12, 2 through 3 says they speak vanity every one with his neighbor with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things and then Proverbs twenty six twenty eight: a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it and a flattering mouth worketh ruin in the last days of the church age people only want a person to tickle them to death they only want to hear good things or they want to hear about things going on in current events relating to the end times. This helps keep their mind off their pet sins that they're doing every day. Hearing about the horrible things going on in the news tickles their flesh. They want to hear some new thing all the time, like they did in Acts 17.21. And most would much rather hear a man get up and preach on the Illuminati, CERN, the wicked entertainment industry, or the election than they would hear a preacher preach on the blood of Christ, practical Christian living, a sermon that pinpoints a specific sin or any basic Bible truth. In this study, I'm just giving you so far just practical Christian living, how you should live. And most people have done turned it off by now because they're bored to death. Because I'm not talking about the Illuminati and the end times and the music industry. And then 2 Timothy 4.3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Also, he wasn't using these flattering words along with a cloak of covetousness. Some men might be wearing a cloak of covetousness because they are hiding their true intentions. God warns against covetousness throughout the Bible. He does in Luke 12.15. It is listed in that long list of sins in Romans 1, 28 through 32. He even says abstaining from it will prolong your days in Proverbs 28, 16. And then in Ephesians 5, 3, it says, But fornication and uncleanness, there's that word again, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. And then Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. False teachers love money, but covetousness may not always have to do with money. It could even be coveting someone else's wife. As it talks about in Exodus 20:17, A man should be content with what he has. He shouldn't want someone else's things or another man's wife. And Paul didn't wear a cloak to hide his covet to hide any covetous intentions he wasn't after anyone's wife or money 
so he didn't soften up his message with flattering words to get these things. Not only did Paul not use flattering words, but he didn't care about getting any glory. 1 Thessalonians 2.6 says, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. We have nothing to glory in of ourselves because we all fall short of the glory of God. As it says in Romans 3.23, And all the true glory belongs to God. Read verses like Romans 5.2, Romans 6.4, 15.7, 1 Corinthians 10.31, 2 Corinthians 10.17, Philippians 4.20. And we shouldn't be putting the true glory in ourselves or other men as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 3.21. And then Galatians 5.26 says, Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. And 1 Corinthians 1.31 says, That according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Many want to have their name posted on the front of everything they do. They want the recognition for all their good works instead of letting God get the glory. Many times a person will advertise themselves more than they do the Lord Jesus Christ. Some groups place more emphasis on the Holy Ghost than they do the Lord Jesus Christ. And this Holy Ghost they teach is foreign from Scripture. This same group places more emphasis on their own personal so-called gifts of the Spirit than they do on anything else. They want all the glory and to feel more spiritual than others feel. The more glory you get down here, the less you will get in heaven. So don't be like Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence in 3 John and verse 9. It's funny how the end of his name sounds like, or looks like trophies a little bit, because he's wanting recognition and awards for things. We shouldn't care about getting honor and rewards from men when we can get them from God after we leave this world and John 5 44 says how can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only 1 Thessalonians 2 6 nor of men sought we glory neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ Paul also wasn't burdensome to other Christians he was probably the best preacher and teacher of his day, but still didn't demand glory or money from other Christians. Notice that Paul wasn't like many mean-spirited Christians today who are mad at everyone all the time. 1 Thessalonians 2.7 says he was gentle. 1 Thessalonians 2.7 But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. James 3.17 But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy paul was someone gentle and someone who was easy to be entreated he wasn't going to get mad at questions thrown at him or make people feel stupid for asking the question second timothy 2 24 says and the servant of the lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient Titus 3, 2, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. I'm sure Paul didn't go around calling everyone who disagreed with him a heretic. I doubt he dedicated his whole ministry to exposing other Christians. As you can see, his ministry was far more than that. Even though he didn't single out everyone all the time, he did single out certain men on occasion, as he did in 2 Timothy 2.14. But his ministry wasn't based around criticizing others. The verse said he was gentle and compared him to a nurse that cherisheth her children. This is far more different than many teachers who come off as angry in every message while it seems they're missing the joy of the Lord. There needs to be a balance. Jesus got angry at times and so did Paul, but everything he said wasn't out of anger towards someone who disagrees with him. We should be gentle toward others, even Christians who believe a different doctrine than us. If another Christian believes in the post-tribulation rapture, then show as much grace to him as you would anyone else. Don't bite and devour him, but show him kindness and pray for him. If a man is overtaken in a fault, 
and go by Galatians 6 1 which says brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual restore such an one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted and this doesn't mean going on Facebook and writing out what they did in the form of a prayer request we should con consider ourselves because we could go through the same things as that person in the future and Paul showed a love for other Christians that we should be showing ourselves. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 It says, So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Notice 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says, Being affectionately desirous of you. Paul longed to be around other Christians. In this case, he wanted to be with the Thessalonians. A good sign that you're saved is that you have a love for other Christians. Paul may not have considered his own life dear unto himself, but other Christians were dear to Paul. And 1 John 3.14 says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Not only were other Christians dear to Paul, but he was willing to sacrifice things for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Notice 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says, We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. And Philippians 2.4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He cared about the needs of others more than he did his own needs. This is lacking in the time we are living in. Most men seem to be only out for themselves. But something else we can learn from Paul is to be a laborer. 1 Thessalonians 2 9 says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. So he labored and travailed. He did hard, painful, physical work for the Lord Jesus Christ. He did this night and day. This had to do with praying without ceasing, studying the words of God. That's called labor in 1 Timothy 5.17. In Ecclesiastes, it says, Much study is a weariness to the flesh. He also traveled around preaching the gospel and comforting other Christians. A good trait for a minister of the gospel is he is willing to work with all his might, as it talks about in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10. And Proverbs 10, 16 says, The labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. Proverbs 21, 25, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refused to labor. Paul was a laborer who worked with his own hands. He knew that his labor wasn't in vain in the Lord, even though sometimes it could feel like it. And God doesn't forget our labor in the Lord's work. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Paul was also a good example to follow, for other believers because of his behavior. 1 Thessalonians 2.10 says, You are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. The sports industry gets their sayings from the Bible. Notice verse 10 says, Ye are witnesses. And then Acts 2.32 says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. On the LeBron James posters, they say, we are all witnesses. The sports industry likes to make their athletes godlike, so people can get more into the idol worship that goes along with it. This is why they gave the name, or the nickname, Chosen One, to LeBron James. Also, his another nickname, King James, is the same name on your Bible in your lap. And many people say he is the second coming of Michael Jordan. Once again, another basketball or another biblical reference. And in the sports world, if you're seen as the greatest of all time, then you are called the GOAT. Isn't it strange how Satan wants to be the greatest of all time? He wants to be like the Most High. And he also likes to be, tr be portrayed in pictures with a goat's head. He wants to be the Most High. But back to 1 Thessalonians 2.10, Paul definitely taught the eternal security of the believer meaning he believed that a saved person could never lose their salvation. And for teaching things like this, he was slandered by others. If you read Romans 3.8, it says, And not rather 
as we be slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So Paul was lied about. People were saying that Paul taught a man could live evil and still expect good things to come his way. Paul didn't teach for us to live wickedly, but he actually taught the opposite. He lived a holy, just, and unblameable life. As it says in 1 Thessalonians 2.10, People today still accuse us of thinking we can live however we want to live. They do this because they hate eternal security. They don't want us to believe that we're once saved, always saved. Just because we believe in eternal security doesn't mean we believe we should live however we want to. We should live right and holy before God, not to stay saved, but because we love God. Paul was unblameable, and this was one of the ideal qualifications for someone who desires the office of a bishop. 1 Timothy 3.2 says, A bishop then must be blameless. And the verse says Paul was unblameable. Notice that Paul seems to give a three-point outline quite frequently. In verse 10 he says, Holy, justly, unblameably. He even goes on to do the same thing in verse 11 where he says exhorted, comforted, and charged. So three point outlines are biblical. 1 Thessalonians 2.11 As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. The way to get people to live holy, justly, and unblameably is to do what Paul does and exhort, comfort, and charge them as a father does his children. Paul exhorted them to live holy meaning he talked to them and motivated them to live right before God. He had comforted them to give them strength along the way. One of the ways he does this is by reminding them of the mystery of the rapture, as he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4.18. And in 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words in regards to the rapture. He charged them on how they were supposed to walk and to please God, meaning he gave them instruction on what pleases God and he warned them on what the consequences of living unholy will be and notice Paul said he exhorts comforts and charges as a father doth his children someone who refuses to submit to the Bible as the final authority or have any other Christians they are accountable to who can exhort and comfort and help them and charge them they will be missing some things just like a fatherless child is missing some things Paul tried to help other Christians walk worthy of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 says that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. Paul says in Romans 6, 1 through 4 What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Notice how Paul isn't endorsing you to just start sinning because you're, you're saved eternally. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we say that are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by bat baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We shouldn't walk like we did before we got saved. You need to get rid of your pet sins that plagued your life before as a lost person. You need to get rid of the movies, TV shows, magazines, bad friends, pornographic stuff, drugs, alcohol. Then you can walk worthy of God when you get all this junk out of your life. Walk worthy of God who has called you into his kingdom and glory. And the, this kingdom in verse 12 is referring to a spiritual kingdom called the kingdom of God. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that you enter the moment you get saved, while the kingdom of heaven is a physical, visible kingdom that will be set up when Jesus comes back and rules and reigns. Many make both of these kingdoms one and the same, but they are different. Something that will motivate you to live holy is that God has called you into his kingdom. Not only are you in the spiritual kingdom of God now, but you will reign with Jesus Christ in the millennium if you will 
Try to live holy and walk in the Spirit while you're in this life. Sinful man would like to counterfeit this kingdom. This is why you have movies like the Forbidden Kingdom and places like the Magic Kingdom. And people like Jay-Z have a CD called Kingdom Come. And he refers to himself as Jehovah. Just type in the word kingdom on international movie database and you will find all kinds of titles with the word kingdom. But none of these kingdoms compare to the Lord Jesus Christ kingdom. If you live right and suffer for Jesus Christ while you are here, then you are counted worthy of this kingdom that God has already called you into. 2 Thessalonians 1.5 says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12, it also says, Glory at the end of the verse, where it says, Who hath called us unto his kingdom and glory. The glory is referring to when we get a glorified body at the rapture. Romans 8 and 8 verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And then Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. We're waiting to get our glorified body at the rapture. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Next we see again that Paul was preaching the words of God and not a satanic counterfeit. If Paul was here today, he wouldn't be using the American Standard Version, Revised Standard Version, the New King James, the NLT, or any other modern version of the Bible. He would stick with the King James because it's the, because it's the only one that doesn't tell lies and the only one that doesn't change the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John 17:17 17, 17 says, Thy word is truth. You need a truth to be your final authority. The English Bible that contains the whole truth would be the King James Bible. If you believe this Bible is the word of God instead of just the words of men, then these words will effectually work in you that believe. A lot of people believe the Bible is just man's words. Therefore, the words of God won't work in them. The Bible says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost in 2 Peter 1.21. So we can believe with our whole heart that the Bible is the truth because the men who pinned down the Bible were moved by the Holy Ghost. And not only this, but God promised to preserve His Word. In Psalms 12.6-7 through 7, it says, the words, of the, Lord are, words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It isn't just the, the originals that were inspired and perfect. The King James Bible is perfect. It's inspired. God preserved his words all the way up to now in the King James Bible. And he will continue to keep his promise. If you believe the Bible is the word of God, then it will work in you. When you start reading your Bible daily and taking it as, as his words, then you will begin to live clean. Psalms 119 and verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. But next we see that Paul is a faithful steward and that he continues proclaiming the mysteries of God. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2 says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. The mystery is the body of Christ. That's the mystery in 1 Thessalonians 2.14. The body of Christ is the church. Ephesians 5.32 it says this is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ in the church. This mystery, like the others, was hid in past ages, but God revealed it to Paul, as you can see in Colossians 1, 24 through 26. 
who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. So this mystery of the body of Christ, the mystery of how all born-again believers are in Jesus Christ. That's the mystery that Paul speaks of in 1 Thessalonians 2.14 when, when he says, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Paul is faithful in teaching these mi mysteries that were revealed to him so that a false doctrine doesn't rise up in their place. So notice he says, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. These churches of God, which are local assemblies of believers, are in Christ Jesus. Every born-again believer is put into the body of Christ when they get saved. And we can read about this in Romans 6, 3. It says, Know ye not that so many, as, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. This is also one of the seven baptisms. It is the baptism which saves, but yet it has nothing to do with water. So the church of Christ teaches a man has to be baptized in water to be saved. But the only baptism which saves is the baptism of the Holy Ghost when you are baptized into Jesus Christ. And this happens the moment you believe. Look at Galatians 3.26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And that baptism in this verse has nothing to do with water. It's the spirit baptism. You're baptized into Jesus Christ's body the moment you believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 also says, For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen. Paul also suffered by the hands of his own countrymen. And it says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, Paul talking, And journeyings often, and perils of waters, and perils of waters, and perils by mine own countrymen. And then in Matthew thirteen fifty seven, it says, And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And it's a good thing when most people speak evil of you. Because look what Jesus said in Luke 6.26. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. If you stand up for Jesus Christ and stand up for him in front of worldly people. Then they're going to hate you for it. John 15.18-20 talks about the world hating you. It says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. But back to 1 Thessalonians 2.14, it says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. The majority of Jews reject the Lord Jesus Christ, so concerning the gospel, the Jews are your enemy. The Jews are blind in part and reject the simple gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. And Romans eleven twenty eight says, as concerning the gospel, they, referring to the Jews, are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. God isn't done with Israel. And Paul talks about another one of those mysteries. In Romans 11.25 it says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So don't think that the church has replaced Israel. God isn't done with them. 1 Thessalonians 2.15 says, Who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. 
the Jews killed the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets. Really though, if you think about it, we all killed the Lord Jesus Christ because he died for our sins. Notice that Paul says, have persecuted us in verse 15. So Paul was a minister who could take persecution and not give in. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you live godly and preach the gospel as Paul did, then somewhere you are going to suffer persecution. 1 Thessalonians 2.16 says, Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sin always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. In the book of Acts, you will read how the Jews forbade Paul and Barnabas from giving out the gospel. Acts 13.50 says, For the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But notice this especially in 1 Thessalonians 2.16. It says, To fill up their sins alway, for the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. God has a cup, and when it gets full, He pours out His wrath. Look at some of these references to get a better idea. It says in Genesis 15.16, but in the fourth generation shall they come up hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Psalm 78 or 75 8 For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, and it is full of mixture, and he poureth it out of the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. The wrath of God will be drunk in liquid form by people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation 15, 7 says, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. Revelation 14, 10 says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured, without, poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. At the second coming, the people will literally be drunk in his fury. Isaiah 63, 6 says, And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make, th make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. God's wrath on sin was poured out on Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. This is why Jesus prayed, Let this cup pass from me. He wasn't trying to get out of dying. But moving on to verse 17, we see that Paul desired to see the face of other Christians. He had the face of others on his mind rather than his own face. 1 Thessalonians 2.17 says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Paul was taking, taken from them, but his presence was still felt after he left. He wasn't taken from them in heart. When someone preaches the words of God, those words stick with you forever and don't just put you under conviction during an invitation. They stick with you even when you walk out of the doors at the end of the service. If a man can get people interested in the words of God, then those words will keep the people holy throughout their Christian life. If they are only relying on his two or three hours of preaching each week, then that will only keep them under conviction for a few days. But not only this, but Paul also had a good understanding of the enemy he was facing. He wasn't ignorant of his enemy's devices. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 says, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul knew that Satan was the adversary, as it says in 1 Peter 5.8. He shows his knowledge of his enemy by writing about him in his epistles. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, he says that the serpent beguiled Eve and talks about how the devil can mess with the simplicity of the gospel. This shows that Paul read Genesis 3 where the devil got Eve to doubt the words of God through a mostly positive message. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15, he describes how Satan appears as an angel of light and his henchmen appear as ministers of righteousness. And Romans 16, 20 shows that Paul knew that Satan was a defeated foe and describes how we will crush the head of the serpent at the second advent. Many believe and teach that Satan is a fallen angel, but the book of Ezekiel actually teaches he was the anointed cherub, as it says in Ezekiel 28.14. But iniquity was found in him, and he was cast down the first time. 
He went from the anointed cherub to Leviathan that inhabits the deep in Job 41. Then he was cast down from the second heaven to the, be the prince of the power of the air, as it calls him in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. This happened when Jesus said he saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And this is why Satan is associated with electricity and airwaves. Michael the archangel will knock Satan down to earth during the tribulation. As it talks about in Revelation 12, 7. And this is when he will be walking about seeking whom he may devour. In a literal sense because the Antichrist will have cannibalistic sacrifices. Then Jesus Christ will cast Satan into the bottomless pit at the beginning of the millennium. And Satan will be permanently put in the lake of fire at the end of the millennium. Sometime around the time of the great white throne judgment. And finally Paul preaches on soul winning, the judgment seat of Christ and the second coming. These are things every Christian should remember. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says for what is our hope. Our joy, a crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. The crown of rejoicing is the soul winner's crown. It is one of possibly six crowns you can receive, or six other crowns, I believe there's seven, that you can receive at the judgment seat of Christ. First Thessalonians 2.20 says, For ye are our glory and joy. The people are the joy. Each time you see one of your converts in heaven, you will rejoice together every time you lead a soul to Jesus Christ. It might possibly put another jewel in, in your crown. As it talks about in 1 Corinthians 3.12. And 2 Corinthians 1.14 says, As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are our your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. The day of the Lord Jesus in this verse is referring to the rapture, which leads to the judgment seat of Christ. Crowns of rejoicing will be handed out at this time. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 says, Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? The first part of His coming is the rapture, where He comes back for us. The second part is when He comes back with us. If you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, that's fine. Why break fellowship over it? What matters most is, is your view on when the rapture takes place, motivating you to live holy at this present time. Since I believe in a preacher of rapture, I stay motivated because I know he's coming back at any moment. I don't want him to catch me slipping on the job. And maybe if you believe in a post-trib rapture, you are living a holy life because you know you are going to need God in the time of Jacob's trouble more than ever. I don't agree with the mid-trib or post-trib view, but I think it is stupid to jump down each other's throat over stupid stuff just teach the truth in a nice way and if a person wants the truth then they will take it but this has been first thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 20